Hey everyone, we're going to talk today about the Web Presenter HD from Blackmagic Design. This is a video encoder, and I'm going to take you on kind of a very brief tour of what the, what the device is all about, and then talk a little bit about my thoughts about it. Uh, I've, had, I've actually had the chance to use it for a few events now, and kind of share my experience with those, and then I'm going to kind of go into some of the more technical details. This thing has a very cool signal monitor screen on it, which helps you to understand what's going on with your input signal, as well as what's going on with your stream. And I want to cover that in detail, because it seems there's a lot of confusion out there about what that data is, what it means, how you can actually take advantage of that information. So, uh, so yeah, so I've actually had this uh, WebPresenter HD now for a few weeks, and I've been able to use it on five events so far, and... Yeah, I think I know it pretty well. So let's take a look at the hardware. All right, so here it is, the Web Presenter HD. So uh, this is one of the Teranex Mini form factors from Blackmagic, which basically means that it's a one-third rack design. You can fit three of these in one rack space. And in order to mount it in a rack, you can pick up one of their Teranex Mini shelves. Uh, it's a perfect fit. They're designed specifically for that. To mount it, basically all you do is add some screws in the bottom of the shelf to go into the screw holes here on the bottom of the unit. Very quick, very easy. On the front panel, we have, of course, a screen to kind of let us see what's going on, to monitor what things, go what things are happening with it. Uh, there is a menu button here we can use to go in and configure, configure the unit from, right from the front panel itself. You also have the options here to take the stream on and off of air, so on air here and off air here. Uh, and then there is a button here to lock the front panel so that nobody can mess with it. And then there is a button over here labeled call and nobody seems to know what this is. And I, I have no idea either myself. So hopefully in a future firmware update, Blackmagic will actually add some functionality there. But we don't know what that's going to be. And then the other thing that we have on the front panel here behind this rubber cover is there's a USB-C port in there. I know you probably can't see that on video, but there is a USB-C port there, which basically duplicates the functionality of the USB-C port on the back. Speaking of the back, let's flip this thing around and kind of get some of the cables out of the way. Uh, we have a power, standard AC power in inlet jack, uh, 110 to 240 volts. We have a 12 volt power inlet, and that's actually what I'm using right now. I have plenty of 12 volt power here in my trailer and powering the unit off 12 volt. And this actually is a four pin XLR, kind of an industry standard. Pins one and two are ground, three and four are positive 12 volts. And then we have an ethernet port for connecting to the internet, for actually doing the streaming. And then kind of hidden behind the ethernet cable there, we have a webcam out, that's a USB-C port. So any of the video that comes into the device will be available simulating a webcam going into a computer so you can use this with any of your any apps that use a webcam like uh, Zoom or Teams or Skype or any of those basically any any video capture application on your computer will be able to bring in video at up to 1080p on there I uh, come over a little further on the bottom right you can't see it uh, we can't see the label because of the cable there but uh, this is SDI input so this is the only video input on the entire unit Above that, there is an SDI loop through output, so whatever video is on the SDI in is also sent directly out on the SDI out. And then to the left of that, we have a monitor output on both SDI and HDMI. And I'm going to save the details for what actually is available on those for the end of this video. It's going to get fairly technical. So if that's something that interests you, make sure you, you stay tuned and watch to the end. All right. Other than that, uh, we just have some cooling vents on the sides and there is active there at at least one active fan inside of there in order to keep it cool in a situation where it might be getting a little bit warm so all right so that is uh, the unit itself uh, let's take a look and jump in to the software all right so this is the setup utility that uh, it runs on windows and mac uh, here you'll detect your device and then you can go in and do some configuration there so we'll click on this little button here and then we can set our streaming standard and basically all these options can be set from the front panel menus as, as well so if you don't have a computer handy you can set those using the menu system you set the streaming standard so this is the video format that's going to be used for your outgoing stream and that can be different than the video format that's coming in so you could have 1080p video coming into the unit but actually be streaming in 720p so we've got several different options here so 720p and, and 1080p in video formats in 720 you have your progressive formats uh, 25 30p 70 and 60p 
Uh, and then in 1080, you've got 23.98, 24, 25, 29, 97, 30, 50, 59, 94, and 1080p 60. So lots of different options that are available for that. For that. So, all right. The next thing here was a place to load streaming settings, which basically this is used to allow you to load in an XML file which contains information about various streaming servers that are out there. So it comes with a number of streaming services already pre-configured in there, but if the one you need is not available, you can go on the internet, basically download a template, an empty XML file. You probably want to steal one from ATEM Mini, that's the most common source of them. Right now I haven't found any blank templates from Blackmagic themselves. But uh, basically, you start with one of those XML files and then fill in the details. So your RTMP server and then various uh, bit rates that you want to use. And then you can import that file into your device using, using this settings feature here in the, in the setup utility. Down, down below here, we actually have the list of configured uh, streaming servers. So by default, it comes with Facebook, Twitch, YouTube. Twitter slash Periscope and Restream.io, but of course you can load your own. This also, this device also does work with Blackmagic Streaming Bridge. I have not tested that myself, but I have confirmation from multiple people that they've worked with that and it has worked just fine. Once you've selected a platform, then, then you want to choose a server. A lot of these streaming services have multiple servers you can choose from. In this case, I've got YouTube selected and they can choose between the primary and secondary. You make a, make a choice there, choose one or the other. And then from there, you'll enter your streaming key. You'll get that from whatever site you're streaming to. Just type that in directly. And then we've got several different quality selecting selections that are available. So uh, streaming low, medium, high. So I don't know the exact bit rates on these. I'd have to look that up. But I'm using streaming high for the most part, and that hovers the the data bit rate between 6 and 7 megabits per second. And then medium and low, of course, are lower than that. It also has settings for hyperdeck low, medium, high, which are considerably higher bit rate, which might be too much for a streaming service, but those options are available there if you happen to be using a streaming service that will, also, will support one of those higher bit rates. From there, you actually have two buttons where you can take the stream on air or off air. So if you wanted to do it from here, you can do that. Or again, do that from the front panel using the on air and off buttons that are there. The second tab here is uh, Setup, so you click on that, and you're able to give the device a name. So if you had more than one of them, you could identify which is which. And then you can select the language for the user interface, and there are quite a few choices available there. Uh, it tells you which software version is currently installed, and if you happen to be running a different software version on the, in the device than what you have running on the computer, when you launch this utility, it will ask you to if you want to upgrade the firmware. And if you choose not to, you will not be able to access the menu settings that are here. So you want, want to make sure that you have your software version between the device and on your computer always in sync, always be the same. Otherwise, you won't be able to access the settings from the computer. We also have here a place to select different different VU meters, or audio level meters. And I can go into a little more detail about that when we get into the monitoring screen. But basically, you either have VU or PPM style, and then those can be either be calibrated to minus 20 or minus 18 dBFS. So basically, whichever uh, standard you happen to use, you can select that and then have your meters in the device actually match that. And beyond that, you can actually set up your IP address and whether you use DHCP to supply an IP address for the device or not. And then below that, you can actually specify connection priority, whether you want the Ethernet jack on the back or a connection to a cell phone via the USB to take higher priority over the other. So if you want to prioritize Ethernet, you can select that. That's the default. But if you wanted to prioritize mobile, say you're in a situation where your mobile connection is actually more reliable than an Ethernet connection, you can prioritize that through through the, the software here or in the device menu as well. And the last thing we have available here is the factory reset to basically reset everything back to the way as when we started. Let, let me talk a little bit about my experience with this device. So I, like, like I mentioned in the beginning, I've actually used this for five different events now. And it actually has worked pretty well. I've been pretty happy with it for the most part. Um, it's really easy to use. Uh, the one big complaint I have with this is the fact that you have to use, you have to actually install this software on the computer in order to configure this. So every time you need to enter a different streaming key, you've got to launch the software and go and paste that in there. You can enter it through the menus, but that would be way too tedious to do in most situations. What I would have liked to have seen would have been for this to have a web server built into it, so you'd be able to just pull it up from a web browser and, and enter that directly without having to go through the steps of setting up the software and making sure that it's up to date. 
so if you have multiple computers that you're using, you're going to want to make sure ahead of time that you've got the latest software installed on all those computers and that the software version matches the version that's installed on the web presenter HD itself. The pricing on this device is currently 495 US dollars and I believe similar pricing through most of the rest of the world as well. And I think this is actually it's actually worth it. It's a, it's a pretty cool device. Similar hardware encoders are from other brands tend to actually be more expensive. So it represents a good value here. The video quality seemed to be just fine. I didn't have any issues with that. Uh, I did not test the lower bit rates. Uh, I, t I tend to prefer to do my streams in 1080 at at least four to five megabits per second. So I kind of have stuck on the streaming high preset. So I can't vouch for the lower settings at this point in time, but I would I would suspect that they would actually work pretty well as well. You know, it is MPEG-4, so it's a fairly widely accepted standard, and Blackmagic has been doing this for a while. I'm sure they reuse code from their ATEM Mini in order to do that, uh, so video quality should be just fine on that as well. Those who watch this channel know that I actually use Teradek Video and Video Go specifically for streaming. So how does this compare to that? Let me com compare and contrast a little bit. So first of all, the big major difference between those is the Teradek Video Go actually has uh, not just the Go, but the other devices in that series have online streaming services behind them which allow you to do things like bonding multiple connections. So with my Teradek Video Go, I'm able to use Ethernet, Wi-Fi, and up to four cellular devices simultaneously in order to make sure that not only I have re enough redundancy, but enough combined bandwidth across all of them in order to get a stream out. So if I'm in a situation where I have very poor connectivity, I can always bond more devices, include more cell phones in, in the mix in order to make sure that I get the data out. The Blackmagic approach right now, they do not have a, a server on the back end in order to handle the bonding feature. So you're only able to use one connection at a time. Fortunately, it does have the capability of automatically failing, so uh, failing from one to the other. So if your ethernet connection goes down, you can fail over to a connected cell phone uh, as well. One thing I found in testing that it isn't just cell phones that actually will work with the USB ports on here, but I also found that my USB uh, modem, USB internet connection stick, uh, this is an LTE device, it actually works as well. So all I need to do is find a USB-C to USB-A adapter cable, plug this into that, and then plug that in, into the device, and the internet connection for that actually worked just fine. I was able to stream over that connection as well. So you don't have to tie up a cell phone. You, if you actually have some of these USB modems, you can use one of those. I, I wanted to mention that when it does fail over from one connection to another, it is not an entirely seamless transition. So there will be some glitching going from one to the other. There may be some downtime while the device figures out that the, the connection that it's currently using has gone down. So if you're relying on this to make sure that you don't have any interruptions in your stream, you may be disappointed if you ever have a problem with your internet connection. So if you're in that kind of a situation, this may not be the right device. You may want to use one that actually does support bonding technologies like the Teradek Video Series or a Live View Solo or, one, or something even higher end than that. Uh, you, you want to have that additional redundancy uh, that this does not provide. However, if you can tolerate maybe an occasional glitch when you have a problem with an internet connection, this device can actually work really, really well. One thing that this has that the that other devices do not have is basically a status screen. And I kind of wanted to show you guys what that is and go over what's going on here in detail because I think this really separates this from other devices. And in fact, this is going to be having access to the status screen is going to change the way I actually handle a lot of things. And I will be using this device for that purpose moving forward. So in addition to using my existing Teradek video product, I will also be using this if nothing for nothing more than the status monitor screen. So what you're seeing here is the video signal that comes out of the monitor ports on the back, whether that's SDI or HDMI. You get the same signal on both. And you can actually use both of them simultaneously. So if you wanted to have it go to two different monitors or two different places, you could do that. But this monitor screen shows you a lot of information about what's going on with not only your your connection and what's happening with your stream, but also with your incoming video signal and audio signal as well. So a lot of cool things here, and I will walk you through all of this so you have a better understanding about what's going on.
The first thing I wanted to point out is that the name of the device is here in the upper left-hand corner. So if you had multiple of these, you'd give each one a unique name, and then you'd be able to tell at a glance which one you're working with. Immediately below that, you've got a nice big indicator here of the status of the, of the stream. So in this case, the stream is currently off, and it's been running for zero minutes and zero seconds. And if I press the on air button on here, it's going to try and stream. It's going to fail, but it's going to try. And you see that flashing red indicating that it's trying to start the connection. And once it actually does go live, once the data is able to get out to your video streaming service, that will go to a standard uh, not flashing, very bright, very bold red to let you know what's going on. Then once the end of the stream comes, you hit the off button, then it'll return back to the off, off state, and it will show you the amount of time that it was live. All right, so next thing, but beyond that, we have the section that describes the information about the live stream itself. So this is telling you which platform you're currently set to go to, whether you're going to a primary or backup server. It shows you the beginning of the stream key, so you can very quickly match that up with what the what the, your streaming service says is the active key that you're using. Make sure you're going to the right place. Now you've also got the streaming standards. This is telling you what video format is actually going out to the internet. And so again, that doesn't have to be the same format that's coming into the device. The device will do video conversion. And then in addition, to, you're also seeing here the preset that's currently being used. So you have a good idea of the quality of the stream and, and or bit rate that's gonna be used. Just below that, we have the section that talks about the video input. So this is, there's a lot of very cool information here. So first thing you want to notice here is that we show, we're showing the last uh, six frames of video. So you can kind of get an idea of what's been happening recently. Uh, and that's always updating. So if I wave my hand here, you'll, you'll actually see that happening. And it's probably the last six seconds. Uh, so you're able to see the, what's happened in the video stream for the last six seconds. So that's, that can be very handy. Uh, so if there was a glitch or something like that, you'd actually be able to see that happening. Be, uh, glance up to there and you'd see that that happened. So, yeah, anyway. All right, then down below that, you're actually able to see the video format that's coming in. And you'll notice here, you're actually, I'm actually sending in 4K video. So this is 2160p at 29.97 frames per second. So this device does support video formats up to 2160p at 59.94 seconds, or 94 frames per second on the SDI video input. It's not able to stream in 4K, but it can accept those signals, which for me is actually really nice because all the videos that I do here for my YouTube channel, I shoot in 4K uh, and it would be nice. It's nice to have a device that can accept that 4K signal and then actually take that live, even if it is being down converted to 1080p. The next thing here we have is the colorimetry. So this is basically the video format, the color format that's being used for HD and for Ultra HD. For most situations, uh, if you're shooting in standard def standard dynamic range, that's going to be BT709. If you are shooting in high dy high dynamic range, that would most likely be BT2020. Uh, but you're able to see here what the data incoming into the device, what format it actually is using. So th then the other thing we have here is a, a flag indicating if there's SDA ancillary data. In this case, there is not. Um, we, can, we can get into a whole discussion about what that is later. But for the, suffice it to say that's extra data that's put onto the SDI signal, and that would tell you whether that, that data exists or not. Down here we have the time code. So if there is time code on the incoming video signal, you'll be able to see that. So if I was sending video from my... ATEM switcher, you would actually see time, com time code coming out of that. In this case, I have the output of my camera going directly into the device, and my camera does not output time code on the SDI, so at, right, as of right now, that's all, that's all, uh, all zeros. Next, we have a flag indicating whether there's closed caption data as part of that SDI video stream or not. Uh, and then I come over here, and then we have S SMTP, SMPTE or SMPT 292 CRC. This is basically uh, indicating whether the so CRC is basically an error detection algorithm. So if there are problems in the incoming data stream where data is being corrupted in transit, you, this would say that this would let you know that there's a problem. In this case, the data format is fine. The data check, the CRC is matching what it's expected to be, and so it's showing OK. If you were to see anything else there, that's a pretty strong indicator that you've got a problem with the cable somewhere and you're dropping or flipping bits somewhere in stream. So. You do want to investigate the, your cable, make sure that you don't have any, any kinks or any loose connections anywhere, and, that, and the cable is capable of carrying the bandwidth that you're, you're sending and that you're not sending it too far. All right, the next section I wanted to address here is the luminance bits and the chroma bits. So there's, there's this section here that deals with bits, and then there's another one down here at the bottom for audio bits. 
And these can be any of three values. So it can be an X, an L, or an H. And so an L means it's a low bit, so it's a bit that's always zero. H means it's always a high bit, or, or one. And then X indicates that that value is changing. So in this case, I'm sending it a video signal that is not just a solid color, not just all black or all white, and so it is constantly changing. You notice that it's showing eight X's and two L's. But what that is telling me, so SDI video is typically 10-bit. What this is telling me is that the first eight bits are all changing and the last two bits are not. So what that means to me is that the camera that I'm using right now is sending an eight bit signal and then it's setting those last two bits, the ninth and 10th bit to zero. So that's why we get the low value. So this tells me that the incoming video signal is eight bit rather than 10 bit. We're seeing that in both the luminance, which is the brightness information, and the chroma, which is the color information that's overlaid on top of that. We're seeing that in both of those fields. So I know that this camera, in, when it's running in 4K, outputs 8-bit eight, eight video. It's 420 four when you're recording, or 422 on the SDI output. So basically, what that's telling me there is the signal that I'm getting from the camera matches what I expect to be getting from the camera. Next thing we want to take a look at here is the audio input. So the first thing you see up on top in that section is going to be the waveform view. So this shows you what's going on with the audio for the last six seconds. The audio that you're looking here is the audio coming from my camera, not the audio that I'm recording. And so uh, as I'm talking in the audio waveform is not moving as much as it would if I was using the audio from the microphone that's above me. It's actually, this is, this is actually the on-camera microphone which is picking up all sorts of other things, and that's why the audio signal is not varying as much as you might expect. But you're able to see there, if you have audio coming in, and it's kind of relative level compared to what it could be at its max. Coming down below that, we can see the sampling frequency, which for SDI should basically always be 48 kilohertz. Uh, you occasionally see 44 kilohertz used with audio, audio professionals, but in video world, we almost always use 48 kilohertz. There's a flag indicating whether there's pre-emphasis on, on the audio, which basically means uh, that high frequencies are pre-boosted in order to overcome noise and other potential issues in the signal. We don't normally use pre-emphasis in, in the video world, so you may never ever see ever, never see anything other than none there. Source locked indicates whether we actually have a signal coming in and that we're in sync with that data coming in. So our internal clock is synchronized with our audio source. So in this case, we are. The word length is, is unknown. Um, I'll, I can cover word length when we talk about word clock in another in a future video, but for right now, it's basically uh, it, there's no flag in the SDI of its signal telling it what the word length is. Not a problem. That's, that's totally, totally fine. Origin, well, again, we won't cover that. Time of day, there is no time of day information in this audio feed, but if there was, it would be displayed here. Now, if we come down to the audio bits, this is very similar to the luminance and chroma bits that we saw up above. So again, we have L, X, or H indicating the bit is low or zero, high, one, or constantly changing. Now, audio for SDI is 24 bits, so we see a total of 24 letters here indicating each of those 24 bits. And so if we've got a signal that is maxing out the levels, we would expect to see X's all the way to the left, but in this case, we're not really even utilizing the last four bits, and very often, and most of the time, not even utilizing that fifth bit, which basically tells us we've got a lot of additional headroom that is not currently being used. So we've got four bits that are never even being, being used at all. If we had a 16-bit audio signal coming in on the 24-bit audio audio input, we would see the first 16 of these either have L's or X's, and then the remaining ones would be L's. But in this case, we are actually getting true 24-bit audio out of this device. Come over here, we have the, with the VUCP bits. So V is a validity indicator, U is a user bit indicator, C is a uh, bit indicating that the video sorry, the audio format is actually included as part of the data stream, and then P is a parity bit, which basically for error checking to make sure that the, the data coming in is what we expect it to be and hasn't been corrupted in transit. Not all devices use all of those, so we, in fact we see here that this camera does not output the V or the U bits, they're low, but it does in fact input the C and the P. Sample address, channel status CRC, 
those are flags indicating more information about whether the video uh, audio signal is, is valid. And then we have an indicator here saying that the aux bits of the SDI are being used for main audio. So basically, SDI has 20 bits of audio natively, and then there are four additional bits in the SDI video stream that can be can be used for audio, but they don't have to be. In this case, we're saying that those four additional bits are being used for audio, uh, not for something else. And then at the very bottom, we have indicating indicators whether up to 32 channels of audio are actually present in the audio signal coming in on SDI or not. It doesn't mean that there is audio on those, just that the signal is present. So the P indicates that it's present. So SDI typically has 16 channels of audio, and we're seeing that here as well. So there are 16 Ps there, indicating that all of those 16, 16 SDI signals are actually present. All right, now, that's the most complicated part to this, so we can get into some of the stuff that's a little more easy to understand and a little more relevant for, for people who are streaming. So the first thing we have here on the bottom uh, is a data rate graph and indicator. So this is, this is telling us what the current bit rate of data going out of the device is. And this will be determined by which quality setting you have when you can so when you set the device up. So in this case, the streaming high, which averages a little bit over 6 megabits per second. So in this case, we are seeing 6 megabits per second. Now, if I was to go to a static graphic, nothing is moving, that bit would drop, would drop quite a bit. The device does actually dynamically allocate bits as needed. And if you've got a really simple video signal, uh, th that bit rate can actually drop. So the, the quality setting that you use is more like a maximum and not something that's always going to be used. So don't freak out if you see that data rate drop to something that's pretty low if you're showing a static graphic on screen. Basically, that's what that, what that tells you is that it's already encoded the video signal using those that few number of bits, and it doesn't need to add any more because the entire picture has already been described at that point. So no worries there. All right, cache. I'm going to go ahead and hit the on air button here to show you uh, what happens with the cache thing. So the device actually has a fairly lengthy buffer in it for making sure that the data for this live stream has, a has an opportunity to go out. Uh, so notice here, I'm sending to an invalid stream key here. So basically, it's not able to not able to send any of the data out. So this cache data, it just every all the data that's being generated by the device is just going into the cache, and it can't send it out to YouTube because I've provided an incorrect key. So that just keeps increasing. But you can tell by how long this is taking to fill up just how long the buffer in this device is. So I haven't timed it, but it is pretty lengthy. I suspect you could go well over a minute without an internet connection, and the device would be able to cache all of that data so that when your internet connection comes back, it would then be able to send that out, and you wouldn't have to worry about dropping. On the flip side, you want to make sure that on the receiving end that your buffer is long enough that uh, the cache is actually useful. So uh, if the cache is the cache on your device was, say, for example, old, able to hold a minute worth of video, but on your receiving side, you're only buffering for four seconds. And once you get past four seconds without data, your stream's going to go dead. So you might want to adjust your settings in order to make sure that your receiving buffer is as long as the cache on, on your device. All right, the last thing I want to talk about here is the level meter on the right. So this basically allows you to see how loud your audio is. Um, I've This is kind of where I've had a little bit of frustrations with the device. Uh, the level meters that are on here do not match the other level meters that I have. So I've got, um, behind me there is a, a Smart Scope Duo from Blackmagic, which has an audio, a couple audio features in it. And then I have audio level meters on my ATEM switcher. And I also have a Clarity M Stereo uh, from TC Electronic that I use to monitor audio levels. And none of those match the audio levels that I'm, level meters that I'm seeing here on the Web Presenter HD. The Web Presenter HD tends to show the, audio, the audio level at a higher level than the, the other ones. Even when this device is is in the yellow and even peeking into the red, everything else that I have is basically telling me my audio levels are fine. So even though the manual on this tells you that you want to stay in the green and just barely dip into the, the yellow, I find that the audio is actually healthier, at least going to the streaming services I've used, if you stay in the yellow and occasionally bounce up into the red for, for very brief periods of time. And that, uh, that has worked just fine without having any any sort of uh, clipping or distortion or other audio artifacts going on. So don't trust what the manual says. I found that you can actually have considerably higher uh, audio level 
uh, on there. Now, one thing I want to point out here, if I bring back the WebPresenter HD application here, and then go into the setup, and then go over to the setup page, we've got different audio, audio level meter settings here. So we've got VU, which is volume units, at, at minus 20 and minus 18 dBFS. Now, if I change between VU and PPM, the meters itself change pretty dramatically. So PPM's peak power meter, and VU's volume units. Um, when I put it on PPM, the low volume, lowest level here on here becomes minus 60 dB, whereas when I'm on VU, it's minus 45. So having it on VU actually shows you more resolution in the upper levels of, of your audio, uh, but PPM allows you to see deeper into the quieter portions of your signal at a loss, with a loss of resolution. Now, is, in terms of which one you should use, that's really kind of your own personal call. I like both, so I, I've kind of been switching back and forth. VU in this case actually gives you a more instantaneous reading, but it doesn't have any sort of peak indicator on there, so you can't see what the maximum audio level has been over the last little while. And if you put it over on PPM, that P, uh, peak uh, is indicated by a solo, there you go, so the, the one, one single bar, if, it, if I clap, there we go. So you see up here that, that one single bar by itself, that was your peak. And that's actually pretty useful, so you're able to see at a glance what your maximum levels are and make sure that you're not clipping on that but but the ballistics on the on the two are actually fairly different and so you kind of have to pick which one you like and then spend some time getting used to it because the way that they interact with the audio levels themselves are fairly different um, but at the same time this does behave fairly different compared to the other devices that I've used and I'm currently using here in my trailer so anyway um, it, it's, it behaves, behaves differently uh, than what I was expecting, but it's certainly very, very useful, very handy to have that there uh, as well. So anyway, a lot of technical information there. So, so if you're wondering what all those different things are, hopefully that helps you out a little bit. I, but I find this to be tremendously useful, that, that screen to be tremendously useful in addition to uh, all the streaming capabilities. So I will be finding a way to utilize this on a more permanent basis. So I plan on installing this in the equipment back in, equipment rack in the back of my trailer and then purchasing and adding an LCD screen here up in the front, specifically meant for monitoring the audio and video signals uh, that are coming in to the device, make sure that the program feed coming out of my switcher really is set up properly with uh, proper audio and video levels and signal types and so forth. So, so yeah, so even at just as a signal monitor, this is pretty, pretty valuable. Uh, but again, it really is made primarily as a streaming device. So the only things that I would change about this personally would be supporting 4K streaming, which I don't think is going to be coming in a firmware update. And also, uh, the ability to use a bonding service in order to aggregate bandwidth from multiple connections and provide additional redundancy. So in the case that one connection does go down or get slow, that the data is still able to get out and you're able to stream without any sort of drops or glitching in the video. So anyway, that's going to do it for right now. So if you have any, qu any questions about this, uh, you can leave those in the uh, comment section down below. Or better yet, join us over on my Discord channel, djp.li slash Discord and ask questions there and not not only will i be there to answer questions but other people in the community will be there as well so it's a great place to reach out talk to other people who use this hardware and ask any questions that you have there so, so if you're new to this channel please consider subscribing i do video production production related content about once a week sometimes more often sometimes less but for those who want even more if you join this channel as a member or sign up on Patreon, there's bonus content that actually is posted there as well. So different tiers get different things. Uh, say, for example, on the members, the YouTube members, the $2 tier, you get early access to the videos without, without any sort of advertising added to them. But you get into the upper tiers and you actually get bonus videos and bonus content. Speaking of which, I wanted to take this opportunity to announce that the, on both... YouTube membership program and on Patreon, anybody who's at the $10 or higher level is going to have access to some of my software that I've created for myself and use in my video production environment when I'm streaming for clients and whatnot. And the first one I'm going to make available is the piece of software that I've been using to do annotations here today. So this piece of software that I've got here where I'm able to mark things up 
And that's going to be a perk that's available to people who are Patreon and YouTube members uh, at the ten dollar and higher level. So I will make I'll be sending out a video here before too long to explain where to get that and do a demonstration video on how it works. So if you're interested in getting some bonus software. Uh, things that are not available to the public, you might want to consider signing up for one of those programs. So anyway, that's going to do it for now. So thanks everyone for watching, and have a fantastic day.